This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. One of Atlanta's top executive chefs, Todd Richards, on this edition of Conversations. A dinner in a fancy Chicago steakhouse ignited a passion in a young boy that would lead him to becoming one of the Southeast's best chefs. Executive chef Todd Richards found his calling early in life. Impressed with the food and presentation of his Chicago experience, he would set his sights on becoming the artist behind such great meals. Chef Todd Richards has worked at some of the top dining destinations in the Southeast, including the AAA Five Diamond Rated Oak Room in Louisville, Kentucky, as well as restaurants inside the Four Seasons and Ritz-Carlton Hotels. These days, he's right in the heart of the vibrant Atlanta restaurant scene. He serves as executive chef for The Shed at Glenwood and The Pig and the Pearl. He's also taken his skills to the Food Network as a competitor on the show Iron Chef. We're pleased to have Chef Todd Richards on this edition of Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Hey, my pleasure. Interesting when I was reading about you, about what happened in Chicago when you were a young boy. Tell me more. Well, my family, they, they were, we were all entertainers. You know, all the birthdays, holidays, and all that stuff was at our house. And so we were always cooking, you know, around the house. Summertime, my dad did all the cooking. Wintertime, my mom did a lot of cooking. And my dad worked overnight, so he worked from 8 at night to 8 in the morning. So before he, he would go to work, we would actually go to dinner. And we went to a steakhouse, and the guy came out with this cart and, you know, this dome, opened it up, and it's this, you know, this magical meat, you know, it was there, and he carved a piece of prime and real put on a plate and, and it was Bernays and then cream spinach and all that stuff. He had this big tall hat on. I was like, you know, <laughs> who is this guy, <laughs> you know? And why does he have uh, you know, all these people around him and why is the crowd going wow every time he comes in there? And and from there I was hooked, you know, I was hooked to, you know, about restaurants. It was something magical just about being there with my family and friends. I mean, it's unbelievable, that experience. How old were you? Right then, I was like six, seven years oh, old. Wow, you know, I remember right? this, you know, distinctly. And wow. funny thing, I was just recently in Chicago, and I was staying at a hotel right across the street from that same steakhouse. And I was like a kid in the candy store. I ran right over there, <laughs> and I picked up, um, I picked up an order of cream spinach, you know, and went to my dad's house, and you know, we just sat there and laughed so much because you know, it's just those memories of food at a young age that really, you know, got my career going. Yeah. What was the name of the steakhouse? In the uh, Laurie Steakhouse. Okay. Yeah. So it's still there after all. Oh, these still, years still. Um, I mean. It looks the same, you know, same quality, same carts going there. Took a picture with the guy, same hat on, head on his, <laughs> his medal. I mean, it was so magical, you know, yeah. that experience. That is so neat how at such a young age something like that becomes so impressionable. Yeah, I mean, for for you know, for my family, um, you know, all the birthdays and everything, you know, where you know, um, uh, during the summertime, it was mine, my aunts, uh, my great grandparents, their wedding anniversary was there at that point in time. So you know, we always cooked out. You know, yeah. the pig and the pearl is a smokehouse, and a lot of those things that we're doing at the smokehouse are, are things I did with my dad as a kid, and yeah. and, and those memories, you know, and, and just the smells and hues and the flavor, you know, it's the reason why people come to restaurants and, and places stay yeah. open forever, and it's yeah. just a real, you know, fun time being in the restaurants doing that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting time right now to be in the restaurant business. It seems like that people are more focused on food and, and culinary delights, if you will, more so than they ever have been. Would you agree with that? I agree with it. And, and one reason why is because people can't cook, you know, and I'm just being being honest. No, you're you know, right. Yeah. A lot of people don't have time. They don't have the energy. Uh, you know, single parents, you know, don't have a lot of time to cook, you know, and, and, and you know, the people are more career focused, you know, and, and so so they rely on us, you know, to get their substance, their nutrition and things like that. So it's a great time. Another thing is is that, you know, the, the world has exploded, you know, with the celebrity chef, you right. know, you know, venture and, and social media and things like that. So people are really interested in the foods and how we come and, and, and the globalization of food, you know, mm -hmm. uh, of cultures and things coming together. You know, people want you know, they want to be wild. And, and the other side of it, too, is that people actually want to let everything go when they get into restaurants. And what I mean is they want to put their cell phones down, they want to check out from the world, and they just want to sit down and have a great meal with their friends, their family, and really talk about food, talk about life and, and things in general. So, you know, all those things make up a really, you know, good, for, good vibrant restaurant scene. Yeah, yeah. 
Tell me about your restaurant in Atlanta. You have two, well, you work at one and you own another. Right. Uh, okay. So let me, let me start with the one that you're the executive chef at, which is uh, the Shed, the Glenwood. Shed in, in Glenwood. Tell me about that. What's you, know, you know, the Shed in Glenwood, it's, it's an American bistro, you know, and, and, but we still really source a lot of things locally. I mean, okay. there's farms, you know, 20 miles, you know, from the restaurant. There's far, you know, farms 10 miles from the restaurant. My pastry chef, Chris, he actually works on a farm in the morning. So we get a lot of things, you know, grown, you know, really local. I really love that place. I mean, we do a lot of sustainable things at the restaurant. You know, we do composting at the restaurant, okay. you know, so we save all our eggshells. We give back to it. It's in the uh, Glenwood Park area, which is, you know, near Grant Park, so it's south of 20, and it's over in East Atlanta Village. And, and the funny thing about it is that's where all the cool kids kind of live, you know. You think about it, you know, a lot of chefs live over there, a lot of bartenders, sommeliers, a lot of artists live over there. So it's a really a vibrant area. Mm -hmm. And the thing about, it, you know, the restaurant is that it's for everyone. You know, the food that we produce, you know, the cocktail program, the wine program, it's for everyone. We have a little bit of this and that for everyone. And people love to come there and sit down and eat. And, and, and the food changes with the seasons, okay. which is really, really something I'm really, really proud of, you know, that, that we can actually, you know, do so and do it properly. You know, we don't serve tomatoes, you know, in December. Okay. You know, I mean, my grandmother, she, she would come out the grave <laughs> <laughs> and whack me across the head if she saw me put a tomato on the plate, you know, outside of that season. Okay. But that's really what the shed is about. It's about family and friends and coming together and having a good time. Okay. So, so what might you be serving this time of year? You know, definitely, uh, uh, most definitely, you know, we really get into pork, you know, around this time of year. So we buy, you know, the whole side. We'll break it down. So we'll have, you know, pork tenderloin. We'll, we'll, we'll use that way. We will braise the pork shanks, you know, use that. Uh, pork chop, or pork chop, I mean, that thing is just, just ridiculous, you know. And then all the vegetables. I mean, eggplants is, you know, is, is really magical right now and right. squash. And so it's all those things things and then we have these you know like little tidbits of dishes like sliders you know mm -hmm. sliders to me you know you know it's really something about Americana when you're talking about sliders you know from things like white castles and everything like that how you can get so much flavor under two pieces of bread you know and that's one thing we do on Wednesday night we try to concentrate on and then on, on you know Thursday nights oysters oysters are absolutely like the biggest phenomenon in Atlanta next to you know sliced bread you know? Yeah, yeah. so we do oysters on, on, on Thursdays but you know my my chefs and you know that that work with me you know we really find inspiration in each other mm -hmm. and how we cook food and how we develop dishes and move things forward what, what might you just just for the fun of it I just mm -hmm. I'm curious what what might you focus on in the summer and the, and the winter and, and well you know it depends on the season too I mean like this year we had a beautiful tomato season in Atlanta I mean tomatoes were really really vibrant you know a year you know prior to that tomato season was absolutely horrid for us I mean chanterelle mushrooms were, were plentiful I mean we had more chanterelles growing everywhere and we were able to use those a lot you know it, but this year chanterelles you know they were almost non-existent so we really have to look at what's actually being produced by mother nature and and really find ways to, to do so so tomato season we felt a lot of tomato dishes naturally you know things to complement that basils and everything that we can find locally and grow. Like onions were a big, you know, part of our, our cuisine, you know, this year. Um, and then, you know, we found things like fish, you know, the seafood season has really changed a great deal. Salmon season was beautiful this year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was absolutely delicious, one of the best salmon seasons that, you know, I've seen in quite a while. Uh, the Gulf, you know, things coming out of that area, you know, out of Texas, the oysters coming out there were really, really phenomenal as well. So it really depends on what's actually taking place, you know, through the earth that we, you know, write the menu for. I like that. I like that. So you're just kind of rolling with the flow wherever the best and the fresh, freshest. Well, I guess really expect that from us. Yeah. I mean, they really, really, really expect us to, to know what's in season, yeah. give them the best product, you know, and also have some value in it as well. Right. And, and we really, really appreciate that. We really appreciate our guests holding us to, you know, that kind of standard, you know, it makes us better chefs. I look at like our fryer oil, you know, and, and, you know, we have a lot of kids to come to the shed, you know, and they like chicken fingers naturally. What kid wouldn't like those, you know? So we use a sustainable chicken, you know, for those. We cut our own french fries in house. We use non-GMO fryer oil, you know, to fry things. Things. So it's a different approach, you know, to the same delicious food that you can find any place else. But we actually are taking, you know, a, a sustainable approach to it yeah. because we are responsible as chefs, you know, for putting back into the earth as well as taking from it. Yeah, I like that. I like that. The whole organic approach to well, am, I, it, it, am I correctly identifying that? Well, or, or? organic, you know, I, I don't have a problem with that yeah. you know, term. I'm sure the government, you know, it doesn't have a problem with it either. Right, right. You know, it's a certification that you have to pay for. Right. But, you know, the reason why I kind of steer away from that, that term, because just because a place 
or, or a food is not organic does not mean it's not sustainably raised. Okay. Now, I mean, I look at a firm, you know, that's maybe five minutes from, from the restaurant, you know, and these guys, I know Joe, I know Judith, they actually grow everything out there. They don't use any pesticides or anything like that. So are they organic? Well, in the sense of term, for me, they are. Wow. You know, have they bought a certification? No, they haven't. But I mean, but I know them. I know the rashes. I know also that our restaurant has contributed to them by composting and giving them stuff back, you know, to put into the soil. So, you know, it's more of a different approach than you would find in most restaurants, but it's still, you know, as chefs, that's what we're, we're, we're supposed yeah. to do. We can't just continue to take away from the earth, you know, take all these things, throw them away, put them in landfills. We have to give it back to the yeah. earth. Very good points. Very good points. I'm yeah. glad I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. T t tell me about the pig and the pearl. The pig and the pearl, I mean, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's, it's what we call a smash up, you know, because we're doing two really distinctive cuisines all in one 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 realm. You know, we have the smokehouse, which is, you know, we if, if, if it's alive, you know, or it can be put in the smoker, we'll do it. So, you know, as far as animals go, we have pork, you know, ribs, uh, shoulder, you know, things like that, pork belly. As far as beef go, we have brisket, um, beef belly. Beef belly is a is a is a part of the cow that people don't utilize a lot of anymore. They used to use it to make pastrami and things like that mm -hmm. years ago, but you know, they stopped doing it, but we've we've pretty much, you know, kind of revitalize that in Atlanta, you know, the beef belly um, and ribs and things like that. And then a lot of vegetables, mushrooms we do, we smoke mushrooms. And then our seafood side, you know, cause you know, we got Carolina trouts coming down. So we'll smoke trout and, and, and catfish and things like that. And then we have a raw bar and our raw bar, we have, you know, six, seven oysters we serve. And we also, you know, do a lot of sashimi out there too. So we do salmon, you know, tuna and things like that. And people say, well, why would you put those two things together? But the raw side of things is a perfect foil to the smoke side of things, you know, because if you eat something that's overly smoked or smoked all the time, your mouth just becomes, you know, full of smoke. You know, yeah. you don't taste any interesting flavors. So we try to find another way to, you know, to break that up. So, we, you know, the oysters with the saline and all the salt that comes from there, it cuts through that. You know, the fish, you know, they'll cut through all those things like that. And then, the, you know, the dressings for the limes and, and things like that for ceviches, it all cuts through that heaviness of smoke. So it's a, it's a way to... So not over um, sensitize your, your your palate, you know, so you can have a balanced <laughs> meal and everything like that. You really spend a lot of time thinking about that. I am a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's good. I don't think the average person, I know, I, know, I don't think yeah. realizes what really goes into preparing a concept or an idea. I, I, I know I'm a nerd. I've been a nerd all my life. I have no problem with saying it. I mean, when most people are on, on their <coughs> phones, you know, you know, playing games and stuff, I'm reading, you know, yeah. and, and I, I I give that to my parents because, you know, reading was the one of the biggest things in, in our homes. We had television, but we could not watch television until we read. And my mom was a biologist. Okay. So I remember when she was going to get her, her second degree that I would tag along with her to go to school because she was going to night school. And she was sitting there with the biology book and I'm looking over her shoulder while she's in class, you know, reading and understanding all these things. So, you know, it, it, it became a, a really big basic fundamental of curiosity, like, why does this happen? You know, why does, you know, why do things grow this way? You know, why do things taste this way? And, and when you really think about it, it, it's really, really a simple formula. You know, we have a really uh, generic formula for developing dishes in a restaurant. And it's, we just make a little t uh, cross sign, it's salt, sour, bitter, and sweet. And we look for those four elements to put on each plate. Because we figure that the average palate, you know, will understand three of those things, you know, or they will look for those certain, you know, concepts. And and the biggest, you know, item that people are really fascinated right right now is bacon. Mm. Well, bacon covers two of those things. It covers the salt side and it covers the sweet side of your palate. So if you look at it from that standpoint, people organically just want things that taste good. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the, the truest form of cooking is just finding things that work well together and taste good. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. You know, I'm glad you brought that up about reading. You know, I mean, it, you, when you study successful people who are, most of them read a lot, <laughs> an yeah. awful lot, and are well-rounded. And it's funny how you can read an article about something and maybe apply it to something totally different right. out of the ordinary that I've learned over the years. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's your process like? How, when, when, when you want to create a new dish or a new recipe, what's your process? How does it come about? How, how's your creativity process work? It usually comes through exhaustion. Um, I, I'm one of those people that, that don't know how to necessarily stop. 
Uh, actually, I'm here with you, you know, despite my first day off, <laughs> you know, four weeks, you know. Well, thank you. you know, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it comes through exhaustion. And what I mean is that the creative process, you can overwork things and overanalyze things. But when you're exhausted, you just have time to relax. Mm -hmm. And when you relax, you can see things from their natural standpoints and natural uh, um, evolution. And, and when I'm exhausted, I just stop and I just see things a lot differently. I see that, you know, hey, you've done this too much or you maybe work on this a little bit more and you just take a step back. And so it's really applying everything that you do, everything that you read, everything that you spend your day to. The other part of the creative process is, is hiring really great people because, you know, great people make you, you know, even better. Everything that I can't do, you know, I, I, I learn from other people. I look at my cooks, I look at my sous chefs, you know, that's great inspiration. You know, we really get into the ethnic value of their upbringing. Uh, like my Sue, a Christian, she's from Guatemala. And, and we look at, you know, her culture and, and the similarities between the food that, you know, her family does and Southern culture. And how can we bring those things together? Mm -hmm. You know, like how she looks at like Chile Reyes, you know, and how can we do our own version of that, you know, and, yeah. and how we look at like our, our, our sandwich, like the pig and the pearl, the sloppy joe we just made, you know, which is, you know, it's brisket that we chopped, you know, and we made the, you know, the sauce to go with it, but it has a little bit of peculiar peppers and stuff like that. And so it's it's a collaborative effort, you know, putting all those things together. And the final thing is, you know, with really being creative is that you have to look at people you find are greater than you. I mean, the great chefs in the world, you know, you know, there's a list that comes out of 50 greatest chefs, you know, each year. And you have to look at them for their inspiration and understand <clears throat> why are they greater. And you find out that you're really, really similar in a lot of ways. You know, it's just that, that they see things a little bit differently or they might, you know, have a source of food that is different, you know, or, or they might grow things a little bit different. So then you take a step and say, wow, well, what if we start doing this? And then you take it back to the kitchen and then we start talking about it. And that's thing you know, the whole menu has changed, you know, and these and these cooks that, you know, you can see them, you know, they, they, their chests, you know, lift up and they take pride in what they're doing. And that's what the creative process is all about for us being chefs. How often will you change a menu? You know, how often does it rain? <laughs> you know, and that's really, you know, it's really funny, but that's just the way, way, way it is. You know, you know, things live and die, and we have to be responsible enough to, you know, to, to, you know, to look at those things and see. Also, the economy, you know, is a big thing. You know, right. when the economy crashed, you know, things that weren't um, used a lot before in kitchens, you know, really started becoming more into kitchens. You know, things like oxtails and beef bellies and pork bellies and everything like that. Things that, you know, oxtails used to be 99 cents a pound. Now they're four ninety nine a pound because, you know, everyone started using it. So, you know, we have a lot of different factors, you know, that change things. Um, and then, you know, people's perception of, of what's fat and what's not fat, you know, like gluten-free. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to, you know, identify things that are gluten-free for people, you know, because they think that's a healthier way of, of, of living. And we have to look at things like oils, you know, what oils people are, you know, want to eat and, and not eat. So there's a, a, you know, a whole gamut of things that, you know, that will affect us how we change the menu. But most importantly, we look at the seasons first. Interesting. Very interesting. Talk to me a little bit about Atlanta. I was uh, living in Atlanta for a little while, spent some time up there this summer, and it really just seems like that that city is just really embracing the food culture, maybe more so than ever before. Am I accurate in saying that? I think there's a big renaissance um, in food culture around the world, but in Atlanta, it's it, it's a reclaiming, you know, or, you know, almost a revival of of really what Southern food is about. Yeah. And, and what I mean by that, if you go to cities like New York and Chicago and LA, and even in London, places around the world, you'll see a lot of Southern dishes, fried chicken, of course, you'll mm -hmm. see deviled eggs and things like that. But to see the South and Southern food is, is not as heavy or as fat, you know, approached as people would think. You know, it's really more sophisticated than this. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, you know the, the making the biscuit is probably one of the most complex cooking techniques in, in the world. If you overwork it, it's going to be tough. You don't have enough, you know, fat in it, it's going to be dry. You overcook it, it'll burn, you know, it won't rise, the temperature's not. It's one of the most complex cooking things. And I think what, what, what Atlanta has shown and what the rest of the South has shown in general is that, that the Southern food is way more sophisticated than that. And, and it's important that we write 
things down, whereas in the North, a lot of recipes were written down. You know, we're learning that Southern culture where, we, you know, we pass things on. There's a more uh, 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 of a, a tone of, like, we have to save these things. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to lead the world. You know, we have to save the world. When the economy went bad, everyone wanted to return back to this sort of thing. Atlanta was really, you know, in the forefront of it, you know, with our approach to, you know, really delicious food that didn't have this heavy laden starched approach that you know that southern food is known for yeah. you yourself do you have a particular uh, dish that you enjoy so if you're if you're going to go home cook for yourself at night or cook for your family at night uh, what that, would you what would you cook well first of all there's nothing at home for me to eat because <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's the truth by the time i get home you know the lights are off you know everyone's in bed yeah. and uh what what we did this summer, uh, which was really really nice, is that we started a container garden on on the balcony, and we grew. We had about seven tomato plants, a couple eggplants, cucumbers, <coughs> uh, basil, and everything. And at first, the plants wouldn't grow, and then we started an ecosystem out there. We've got a hummingbird feeder. We bought other plants, you know, so the bees would come. Yeah. So we spent our entire summer just like eating tomatoes and and eggplants and all the stuff that we grew ourselves and cucumbers and everything. So it was so, you know, it was so fulfilling, you know, to, to have these things, you know. And so I find myself eating simpler at home, even going out to eat, I eat way simpler now than, than ever before. And I'd rather just graze around the menu. Like, I can't, I can't commit to an entree, you know? Yeah. Someone says, you know, hey, I'm gonna give you a 10 ounce steak and, and I, I can't do it, it's too much of a commitment to me. But if you say, give, I'll give you, you know, the whole appetizer side of the menu, then then that I can I can, I can can run down that and, and go very well. But at home, you know, we just sit down and eat. You know, it doesn't really matter. It, sometimes we'll just buy some salami and cheese, a little bit of lettuce, olive oil and balsamic vinegar, and that's the way we, we eat. We just graze around sit around and talk and have a great time. Yeah. Well, that's so, it, it, just, just the personal relationships and yeah. communication, so much about yeah. what having a great dinner is yeah. all about yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, give the viewers some tips if they want to have a backyard garden and they don't have a lot of room. I mean, I know a lot of people are talking about right. that and wanting to do that. What, what, are, what are tips that you would give well, someone? Well, I, I mean, and I'm being serious. When I say it's our balcony, it was our balcony of, you know, uh, on the house, you know, we're talking about an eight foot by six foot area. And we put all the plants in containers. So we had, you know, seven containers around the backside, you know, where the most sun was. So that's where we put the tomatoes and things like that. Things that needed less, you know, we pulled away. And then we built the ecosystem. So we had, you know, purple flowering plants, yellow flowering plants out there, plus basil and other things that would draw bees. And then the hummingbirds. So it was really, you know, amazing because when we first started, the tomatoes, you know, was on, a, on a picture, it was supposed to be this big, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then we grew our first tomato and it was like that big, you know? Like, like we just wasted all this money. What the, you know, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, we started fertilizing and saving eggshells and things like that. You know, then the bees came. And once the bees came, well, first the wasp came, and then carbon of bees, and then the bumblebees came, you know, then the birds came. And next thing you know, our garden just, you know, was just flourishing with tomatoes and everything like that. And when my dad moved down from Chicago, you know, he loves to make cucumber tomato salad, and he just ate it, you know. So now, you know, they're basically done at the house, and he's like, well, I can't go to the store now and, and buy a cucumber or tomato because I know it's not going to taste, you know, this good. Yeah. So, you know, I just tell people, and, and, and people will ask, you know, through social media, how do you do it? And I said, you just have to build the right ecosystem, you know. And it's really some if I can do it, I mean, I'm at the restaurant 12, 14 hours a day, yet I can still build a garden this way. Anyone, you know, can take the time and do it correctly. Interesting you bring up about composting. So you're talking about saving eggshells and stuff. So what, what are tips on how you should go about, do, you know, composting? Well, if you're going to do it at home, first of all, make sure it's something that's kind of airtight because, you know, the, the smell can be <laughs> a little off-putting. off, off putting. You know, but honestly what I would do is I would just find a farm. You know, and I would save it, you know, just like you save your regular trash, put all this stuff in, in there and just take mm -hmm. it to a farm. You know, and let them compost it for you, and then you know, go back and pick some up from them. I mean, just recycle it that way. I wouldn't recommend doing it at home. Okay. You know, it's just too many things that can can take place. But you know, just save it, take it to a farm, 
you know, say, hey, I got some stuff, can you throw in your compost and cast some compost back? And I'm sure most farmers, nine times out of 10, will be more than happy to do so. Yeah. And so you get that more natural fertilizer. Yeah, yeah most definitely. And like you say, well, it works works nicely. Yeah. You, you mentioned something, in a, and, and I don't know if this is inside of your wheelhouse or mm. not, and I apologize if it's not, but you mentioned about bees coming back. What's been the whole situation? There's been a lot of talk that, that we're seeing the bee population fall greatly. Are, 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 you I, attribute I, that to anything in particular? I, 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 I'm not. I'm not one of the uh, scientists, you know, or anything by the, by that stretch. I just know that what the farmers tell me, and the farmers just tell me that it, we are so many people. There's so much pollution. There's so much things out there that bees have a hard time navigating, and we have deforested, uh, you know, a lot of the world. We have deforested and deplanted a lot of the world, and so the natural habitats in which they live in. They're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> again, just for us, you know, at our home, we did something, you know, that we thought was a novelty, and then we found out that it was really important, and we continue to do so. And I look at the flowers around our whole area, you know, our next door neighbor's flowers. Look how beautiful they have changed since we have more bees, yeah. and the hummingbirds are there, you know, and the birds come. And, and, and to me, it's, as a show, it's just so important that I keep telling people that you have to do this. You know, food will run out if we don't do this. You know, the ocean is vast. There's only so many things in there we can eat. Yeah. You know, we have to be responsible. I, I want to keep cooking, you know, but yeah. there's no food to keep cooking, you yeah. know? <laughs> you know? And, and for our, all our kids, you know, generations to come, we have to be more responsible. So I don't know why they're not there, you know? I just know that there's ways that we can help them come back. Thank you so very much for joining us. Best of luck to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Chef Todd Richards, he is uh, certainly one of the star executive chefs in the Atlanta area, which the Atlanta restaurant scene has become quite vibrant in recent years. We appreciate him spending some time with us on this edition of Conversations. By the way, you can see more of our, con our, our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoy the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you. I'm Jeff Weeks and I love to talk, but I find I learn a lot more when I listen. I hope you'll listen in on the next conversations. We talk with engaging personalities from all walks of life, sports, business, politics, science, entertainment, literature, you name it. Some are names you know, others are ones you'll be glad to get to know. No talking points or agenda-driven tirades. It's real conversation that matters.